the call for some form of new capitalism stems in large part from rising inequalities of income, of wealth, of opportunities, of hope. Um, in many sovereign nations and among many citizens around the world, this call for new capitalism is, is we see in some sort of backlash against the existing economic order, against globalization, uh, against markets. Um, with some sovereign nations building walls like the United States, the vote of Brexit in the UK, the Gilets Jaunes protest in France. So the question becomes, what do we do? Um, we can think about the causes and consequences of, of these rising inequalities and calls for new capitalism, but most importantly, we need to think about solutions. Uh, we have two distinguished panelists, Ray Dalio, the founder and chairman of the global investment firm Bridgewater, and we also have Zhang Lei, uh, the founder and CEO of the global investment firm Hill House Capital. Uh, we'll start with Ray. Ray's going to share some thoughts about where we are and what solutions might be, and then we'll turn to Lei. Ray. I, I should explain that uh, my perspective is very much like a mechanic of cause-effect relationships. I'm not, it's not ideological. But to me, the economy works like an economic machine, and it's a perpetual motion machine. And um, it's a, it has long-term cycles and short-term cycles. I've learned that uh, whenever I made a mistake, many things happened that didn't happen in my lifetime before but happened in prior lifetimes. So I just want to describe very simply how the machine works and where I think we are, because uh, the same things happen over and over again through history, going back many dynasties in history. Um, first, there are four major drivers. There's productivity. In other words, over a period of time, our living standards rise because we learn how to do things better and we get more output per man hour. Um, then there's cycles, short-term debt cycle, recession, expansion. Economy becomes too weak, inflation is low. Um, monetary part of policy creates credit, credit creates demand, and then you have a pickup tightening a monetary policy, and then we have um, the recession in those cycles. Um, there, so that's around this productivity. Around that is also a long-term debt cycle, which is an accumulation of these other cycles in which then there you, uh, there's a cycle which uh, ends largely when you have a situation where you hit zero interest rates and then you print money and it's not as effective. So we'll talk about that in a second. And then, of course, there's politics. Those are the four things. There's internal politics, people at odds, uh, internally and externally. So I think the period that we're in um, is unique. In, um, let's say we're 10 years into, the, well, let's take technology. Technology is artificial intelligence and so on is replacing people and it's, it's great for the whole but it changes the nature of uh, the environment and that's going to have a very important implication in the years ahead. Uh, as far as the short-term debt cycle or the business cycle, we're 10 years into this expansion and uh, many of those uh, stimulants that happen will be dissipating. We won't have more interest rate cuts that are material. You won't have more tax cuts and so on. And this is true around the world as we have our obligations. So we're coming into this period that is sort of a big sag, not a debt crisis in that way, but a lot of obligations that are coming at us, particularly in the mature reserve currency countries. Um, and they include pension obligations, health care obligations, and the like, large deficits which will have to be monetized. They'll print money to deal with that. There's a rec reserve currency issue. That also means that if there's stimulative monet if you get a downturn, you're not going to have monetary policy work the way it did before. That may enters the political realm of coordination of fiscal and monetary policy. It's a new world order. Um, as far as um, the, so that's, those are the cycle. As far as the politics, naturally, because of this particular dynamic, because of three major factors, um, there's a wealth gap, a widening wealth gap. Um, and with that, an opportunity gap and a values gap. Um, that's because monetary policy buys financial assets. That makes financial assets go up, and those who have financial assets have a lot of money, a lot of demand. Um, there's technology that's changing that and creating wider spreads. It benefits companies, and, but it also displaces people and there's globalization, those, those factors. And then, of course, we have the external conflict or the issues of the rising um, of a great power in the form of China rising and the United States um, having its, um, its uh, let's say, relative decline. 
So we're at a point, um, I think, that is very similar to 1944. Uh, There's a war, at a war, after a period of war, there's a period which there's a peace because nobody wants to fight the country that has um, in the, and won the war, and there's a new world order. And there was a new monetary system. 1944, we established the dollar, reserve currency-based monetary system, and the like. And I think that all of that, all of those, is going to really change the world order in dramatic ways in the next 10 years. Hmm. Ray, that's a tour de force overview. I want to bring Lay into the conversation. One of the forces you mentioned, Ray, is uh, primal to this is technology. And Lay, I know you have some thoughts on technology has the possibility of being an equalizer rather than a disruptor. Love to hear how you see that in your investments and more generally in our world. Sure, sure. Um, Ray talked uh, elegantly about this, how this uh, massive economic machine works, and uh, I want you to uh, pick just a little bit of that and talk about the technology and the second, third order effects and some actually, I think, uh, um, uh, you know, accidental coincidence, if you will, that will happen to the society. And we all observe the spectacular rise of the lacks of funds in the U.S. and BETs of China that also uh, you also see that the traditional businesses and average workforces actually have been left behind. So I'm a bottom-up based investor as a private equity investor. One of the, uh, one of the deal we did uh, a few years ago that we actually bought a traditional offline retailer of uh, a footwear retailer. It couldn't be the worst possible businesses for formal dress shoes for, for you know, like uh, women footwear and men footwear and in the offline retail, and also uh, the, we have like 20,000 stores, 120,000 employees in China. And uh, uh, people thought that private equity guys would do is just lever it up, and chop them into pieces, and closing the store, lay off people, that's a way to make money. We actually thought about, we, we look at the business, we actually say, oh, look, you know, we actually have the 120,000 employees, they're actually our assets, they're not liabilities. How do we leverage technology to make them more productive? They are actually our UI, UE. They are our user interface, user experience. They just don't have the adequate toolbox for them. So we develop the tools, the apps for them. We make the information much more transparent. We develop the YouTube-like tutorial for them to learn and the, all the newest models and all the shoes we put in, uh, you know, all in our experimental stores. We all have the, uh, the chip inside so we, that we know which shoes be in the shelf for more than 30 days, nobody touch it, or you know, being shoved uh, for the people try it out 30 times, but nobody purchased it. Maybe it looks sexy, but not comfortable, not comfortable to wear. So all those information get uh, transmitted back to headquarters much earlier instead of waiting for the next season to be a uh, inventory. So I think this turns out to be a company that had experienced probably I would say 16, 18 quarters of sequential decline. And after we took over the businesses, actually the, the business had been growing over 50% on EBITDA in the last two, three years. And also uh, we actually, by and large, kept most of the employees, retrained them, and they get more productive, they get more proud to go to work. Even most of them are migrant workers, actually uh, uh, the store clerk. And we, we, our goal is to transition them from a, you know, box mover to uh, fashion consultants, uh, if you will, tech-enabled fashion consultants, if you will. I think this turned out to be a win-win-win solution that uh, we as private equity owner, uh, you know, makes money because we are able to grow our cash flow, grow our EBITDA, but not by, you know, cut, cut cost, actually, in the beginning, uh, increasing in spending on technology. And we make the employees uh, more proud to go to work, more productive, and we have better products for consumers, much faster iteration, and uh, good for society. I think if there, we take this, like, I'm not saying government uh, had no role in this free enterprises. If there are way that a government can incentivize and uh, create, uh, encourage more private businesses to adopt technology, make technology not just as disruptor, but also an equalizer to bring people left behind to leverage technology to make it better. I think if we can create a system to do that, uh, that, you know, that we actually are going to have a win-win-win solution. So like, that's a great example, I think, that, of how technology can create more opportunity for workers as well as for the firms and the other stakeholders. I'll bring in our fire starters, Steve and Dabista. How do you see, Dabista and Steve, 
a role of government. You said government needs to do something more. So what's one thing the government could do to allow us to see around the world more of those technology as growth opportunities like Lay described? Look, I think there's a whole bunch of things government should do. I think, uh, I think that the, the highest priorities are more on making workers better off, dealing with the educational problems, dealing with the infrastructure problems, dealing with the lack of R&D spending. You know, government in the U.S., has essentially come to a halt, except for occasionally passing a tax cut or something like that. And as I said in my opening remarks, I think, I think government has an important role, not just in enabling the kinds of businesses lay buys, but, uh, but as we, I think, talked about in this conference, if we don't do something, we're going to end up in a worse place. We're going to have populism. It is going to take down capitalism, and we're all going to be a lot worse off. And so I think sure. there's a big role. So role of human capital development, public investment? Human capital, yeah, yeah. And I think there's certainly stuff government can do to enable companies like Lay's to yeah. prosper, but I think the highest priority is addressing the state of the average worker, at least in America. Thank you. Yeah. So um, I think it's absolutely essential that government actually innovates as well, and I think this is really building on Steve's point. Um, we're talking about capital allocation decisions that governments um, have a responsibility for. In many respects, in emerging markets, and today 90% of the world's population lives in the emerging world, the, the capital allocation decisions are pretty basic. Build a school, build a road. But they're failing to do that. Um, and of course, as you develop and g g go higher up on the trajectory of economic growth, those decisions around capital allocation become much more difficult because they're intergenerational. Um, not to say that those issues don't uh, arise in emerging markets, but really the urgency around capital allocation is much more uh, immediate um, in, and, and in many respects much more obvious in, in poorer countries. I will just say um, that one thing that has been attributed to uh, Mike Bloomberg, who's sadly not here, is that really for government, there, there are four attributes that are critically important. One, they should be data-driven. They should be forward-leaning. They should focus on measured outcomes, and there should be no corruption. And if you have these four attributes in government, you will see success. And I think if you look around the world today, what we see as a failure for many governments in developed and developing countries is that they don't meet all those four criteria. Thank you. So a solution around data-informed public-spirited investments in human capital, especially for the average worker in, in many sovereign nations. Ray uh, and I, Lay? I, I can right. add one point on Steve? Yeah. Sorry for that. Can I add on Steve's point? Actually, I agree and I disagree with Steve. Uh, I agree with him that the, the, it should be a huge priority for the government on the education workforce. But I'm not sure government run program is a good thing. I actually think the way that we see many more private enterprises focus on education workforce is much better model than the, uh, the government-run programs. One of the companies that we invested actually trained the migrant workers in China just to, for them to be chef, for them to be nursing home caretaker, for, uh, for them to be, uh, you know, uh, auto repair workshop. So I think those people, they actually much more go for uh, market-oriented jobs, and there's uh, market testing that results. The government is a way to create incentive around that for the enterprise to do the job. So I'm just not as sure about the government well, programs. Well, I would, I, I would uh, just say, I would just say uh, China and the U.S. are different. Our experiment with for-profit education did not go very well. <laughs> uh, the companies all went bankrupt. The students ended up in debt, and nobody really learned very much. So you should take your companies and bring them to the United States <laughs> and show us how to do With uh, maybe training. fiscal incentives, tax incentives for that private education as well might be one remedy there. Um, Ray? I, th I think the real question is who's in control, and, and when we say government, there are different approaches to government, right? Sure. So the big difference um, between the United States and uh, China it has to do with a bottom-up um, versus a more of a top-down. But there, I think there are four entities, bro broadly speaking. Uh, there's government, and then the question is who selects government and how well does it work? Right. Then there's um, the, the capitalist. Um, so that's a profit-making system. Um, and then there's the worker who is part of that system. And then there is um, technology, which is increasingly intelligent. So we're now having the capitalist uh, build technologies um, that are intelligence. And so the uniqueness of the individuals being diminished. And so their power is shrinking. And they're choosing the government. And the question is how well they choose the government. So at the end of the day, the question is how will that power game play out? Will it be the capitalists who, for example, will own the technology? Sure. Who will own the intelligent technology? In the United States, 
more and more it's, you know, is it the corporations who are going to own the technologies or is it the government is going to own the technologies? And that dynamic has to work itself out. So when we think about that, we have to say, can the individuals who still have a, they have a power through a vote, but they have a diminishing power in this situation, how will those changes be made? So it's a question of systems, really. Yeah, yeah. look, I yep. agree. I, can I say one more thing? Please. I agree with all that. And I, but I would argue that of the four things that you just mentioned, the one that is working worst is government. And it may be for the reason you say, that individuals aren't really making the right choices. But if we don't fix yeah. government... But the question is, who's we? Let's go back <laughs> to the particular. Are we as a voter? <laughs> we as an... Uh, and who? Because we're part of that we. And how does that machine literally work? Let's not be theoretical. We have to deal with that population choosing the government, and is that an acceptable prob path? And so you can understand that in, in China, maybe they don't think that that path might be the best path, and so it's a question. I don't know what the best path is, but that's the crux of the issues of the two systems. So, Lay, when we hear uh, uh, there's this key issue, and I'd love to hear your insights from your global perspective. When you look forward in time into your proverbial crystal ball, do you think that sovereign governments informed by their people or firms will, will be able to generate this human capital and this technology as an equalizer. How do you see the evolution of, of these, these forces in your, based on the investments you have? Yeah, um, I, think, I think this really interesting, very, really interesting paradox in a way that the system had worked until it doesn't work. <laughs> and, uh, so I think we are probably at this sort of the break point in the sense that it works so well just exactly because it works so well. And the ones that they ignored or the second and third order effect start to play more and more significant role. I think we just need to be much more conscious of them. I'm, I, I'm not so sure I understand every implication of that. I think the getting to the bottom of that, understanding that implication, even AI, even that keep on feeding you the same data that you, you're interested in, or, uh, you know, look at my, uh, you know, I, I have a, a young son that uh, he is like uh, now in, uh, you know, you ask him, like, uh, teach him a math, 18 plus 15, he'll say, Alexa, what's 18 plus 15? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not sure AI is, uh, yeah. you know, you, you, so, so I, I think we need to be much more, I don't know, I don't have an answer, which I just want to have more conscious a more thoughtful process towards that. Sure. So given that thoughtful process metaphor, thinking about your son and all of our children metaphorically, time has flown as I knew it would. So I'm going to go very briefly down the line, starting with Dambisa. If we had the assembled leaders of both business and governments that could really make a difference on these themes of what the future of capitalism might look like, what is the one recommendation, you, solution you would ask them to pursue? Starting with Dambisa. Absolutely moving away from short-termism. Anything that, to me, um, within politics or business of encourages or incentivizes pe to people to think in the short term, whether it's short-term um, election cycles or incentive uh, packages in the short term, I think are deleterious for long-term economic growth. So really, in terms of my own board experience and the things that I focus on, we're focused much more on trying to pull people's thinking away from that. Great. Thank you, Steve. I, I would say, at least again in the U.S., moving away from the extremes, which has really caused this gridlock, caused this lack of any solutions, and finally getting back to a place where people are compromised. I'd be interested if Lay wants to come out on this when we get to him, to the last interchange. Mm -hmm. Which system works better, mm -hmm. the Chinese system or the American system? Okay. Duly noted, longer termism, move to the middle. Ray, the one piece of counsel. I think we have to go above ourselves to the what is the common good. Let's say if we're dealing in, in within our countries or between our countries, that you have to be able to have um, c declare these things as an emergency, a national emergency, international emergency, and that it has to be skilled parties that represent these to create a common to bring people together in a way where, in a skilled way and in a nonpartisan or bipartisan way that it is engineered to produce a better result. There's enough resources that go around to be able to do that, but I don't, it has to be declared as an sure. emergency and it has to be sure. dealt, engineered from the top down. Top down emergency, skilled moderation, and Lay, you're gonna bring this all together for us? <laughs> I'm not sure. So I, I think it's, we need to have much more conscious, thoughtful, intellectually honest way to examine 
the actually the history and the future orders of the mechanism. I think the one wisdom going that uh, history help us predict the future, but people today write the history. <laughs> so we want to be make sure that we are learning the right things from the history. Great. Thank you all. The future of capitalism is quite uncertain, but I think you hear a lot of optimism here at the same time. So thank you to all four of the people up here for sharing their insights. Thanks, everyone. Thank